A year ago today, you were in Chicago. You knew you were going to be president, but you weren't. What didn't you anticipate? What did you underestimate? What didn't you know? Well, I think the main thing is we didn't understand the rapidity of job losses in those first three months, January, February, March, actually starting in December. You saw 700,000 jobs lost or 650,000 jobs lost in each of those months. So uh, none of the economists had anticipated that. Uh, by the time uh, we were uh, in legislative session had actually passed a recovery act, you had already seen over 3 million jobs lost uh, on top of what had been lost the previous year. And that meant that unemployment was going to go up higher. Uh, and even as we moved aggressively to start boosting economic growth, uh, we knew at that point the job growth was going to be lagging severely and that that was going to be one of our greatest challenges. You surprised me a little because I think, and I've heard other presidents say, mm -hmm. the thing that you can't anticipate mm -hmm. is the weight of the job yeah. when it comes to you, particularly when it comes to committing young men and women to war? Well, I, I will tell you that, uh, unfortunately, I anticipated the difficulties involved in managing two wars uh, at the same time. Um, I think Iraq has actually gone better than we anticipated, or at least as well as we could have anticipated. Uh, and uh, I've been uh, very fortunate to have extraordinary leadership, not only in a, uh, Secretary of Defense, Bob Gates, who uh, understood all the ramifications of uh, our wartime policies, but also having Ray Ordierno on the ground, who's been doing outstanding work. Uh, so Iraq, uh, I think we knew we could manage, and we have. Uh, Afghanistan, we understood, was going to be a problem. Now, we have been uh, disappointed, I think, in uh, the fact that the Taliban had gained more momentum during the course of the year than was anticipated. Uh, when General McChrystal came back with his assessment, the sense of what deterioration had taken place on the ground uh, was worse than what had been initially reported. Um, the weight of making decisions around sending young men and women into war uh, is something that, uh, frankly, I foresaw being uh, difficult. When you're in the midst of making the decisions, though, nothing compares. And when you meet with families and you talk to uh, soldiers who've come home uh, disabled as a consequence of their service. Sure. Uh, the, the, the sheer emotional force of that, uh, I think, is something that you can't anticipate. It's something that um, hits you like a ton of bricks. I've always been fascinated by this question of, of what it takes and what you have to go through internally mm -hmm. to send kids off. As you said a few moments, or when you were in the Nobel speech, you said some will kill and some will be killed. Right. It's an enormous responsibility. And before Gulf War I, I went to Kuwait, and I talked to the commanders, Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force. Right. And I asked them, that, what, what does it feel like to commit kids to war? And they all said, we don't. The president does. Mm -hmm. It's his job. We just carry out his orders. Right. And I thought, holy God, what a weight that is on your shoulders. It, it, it is tough. And uh, you know, probably the most powerful moment uh, of my year uh, was when I traveled up to Dover and uh, not only met with the families who were there in the middle of the night waiting for their loved ones to come home in caskets but walking up the ramp of the transport plane uh, by myself and seeing those caskets um, it, it's, it's, uh, it's indescribable and it reminds you of the extraordinary courage and sacrifice uh, that these young men and women are willing to make. Uh, but it also reminds you that um, you have this solemn obligation to make the best possible decision that you can make. And that uh, there is an element of, of tragedy involved in war that is inevitable. And that was the topic of uh, what I spoke about last week. And, and if you don't understand that, uh, if, if you think that this is all chest beating and glory, uh, then you're probably not making the best decisions possible. But as you went through that assessment mm -hmm. in recent weeks, 
Is there a calculus in your mind? Do you have to go through it? What is this worth in terms of human life? Yes. Is this goal worth 500 lives, 1,000 lives, 1,500 lives? Does that go through your head? I don't think that you make a, de uh, a decision trying to weigh the value of one or ten or a hundred lives because every life is precious. I think you make decisions based on an assessment of America's national security, the potential for uh, additional lives, thousands of lives potentially being lost if we're not uh, making the right decisions that preserve that national security. Um, what you want to make sure of is that in these decisions, uh, you are not um, making them based on abstractions, uh, notions of uh, you know, a battalion here or a battalion there, a brigade here or a brigade there, without understanding that in each of those battalions, in each of those brigades, uh, there are young men and women with their lives ahead of them uh, who you are committing. And so that is a constant ballast, I think, to making uh, uh, the best possible decisions. But look, uh, part of the decision I have to make is also uh, what is the absolute best way for us to prevent another 9-11 from happening? What is, what is the, you know, how do we make sure that, uh, that we're not in a situation in which uh, a major American city is threatened? So uh, all these things go into the calculus. Um, in, in the end, uh, the best you can do is make sure that you've heard every opinion, that you have evaluated and analyzed every aspect of your decision, that you have clarity about what your choices are, understanding that the choices that you have are very rarely uh, the ideal choice sure. versus uh, a terrible choice, but rather a range of choices, all of which have problems with